As Natalie emerges from the subway with her adoptive sire. Natalie, how are you dressed for the outside world? I am... I'm dressed in a black dress that goes around my knees and has a white collar on it. It's very, um, not in and very not stylish. Um, it, it was once, but not anymore. Um, it's a little frayed at the bottom as well. It's not dirty in any means, but it's just, it looks off, uh, in between um, what would be more colorful and, I guess, normal clothing. Um, she, she, she seems put together, but she's just, there's just, there's something off about her. Her makeup is a little too dark. It's a little too black around her eyes. It's a little too much. It's like she's put makeup on in the dark, which she has. Um, so, so that's that's more or less how she looks. She is incredibly pale, and not only from her well, vampirism, um, but also because she never ever sees the sun, um, and she doesn't really do anything with well her makeup to prevent looking pale. She just looks like that. She has uh, dark circles under her eyes, um, and looks like she did when she was embraced. Kind of a little skinny and a little malnourished and a little uh, like a walking dead mm, you look acceptable you can take my arm if you're that afraid of being out here I don't really like being out here I know she, she takes his arm we're going to continue our little experiment Natalie there are a lot of noises out here a lot of noises a lot of faces a lot of things you need to come to know there is no point to being a predator hiding in a subway sewer I like hiding. It is no way to exist, Natalie. You are no good to me if all you can do is chop up bodies. But isn't that what we no. do? No. Do not diminish what it is that we do by classifying us as grave robbers. There are members of our family who are that debased. I am not that way. You should not be that way. Just because we spend our time talking philosophy, talking about matters of life and death, does not mean that that is all there is to us. So where are we going? We're going to see a slice of life. This is the West Village. You probably remember it from when you were alive. I know you have been to the surface since dying, but you've probably not been around here often. I, I remember it. Do you know when you were uh, embraced it was very near here? I don't remember that, no. You probably don't remember much of that night. No. As I said. Not really. You were high at the time. Yeah. Now I need to demonstrate something for you, Natalie. All these people milling around, doing their late night shopping, hanging around at bars. Look, there's some theatre in the park over there. They all seem to be taking joy, don't they? Some kind of joy from life. Yeah. Why do you think that is? I guess they are having a good time. They're entertained. Um, maybe they're drunk? Mm. I don't know. Maybe. How much of it do you feel is ignorance? Most of it. I assume most of them are just there to make and create surface relationships. Not really anything you can use. Maybe they're just out to find someone to take home and have sex with. Hmm. Probably. What kind of living being do you think has the greatest view of what life and death are all about? Hmm? Are we living? Not us. These people all around us. Oh, some of them may be like us. Some of them may even be addicted to the kinds of 
vitae in our veins, but people with pulses, people who breathe, people whose chests move up and down. What does it take for someone, one of them, to understand life and death? To die? Hmm? Possibly. But then they ha can't speak about it, can they? They can't demonstrate their knowledge. We can. Aren't we dead? Yes, but we are not alive. You're missing my point, Natalie. Come on. This place is full of rich, living, happy, giddy, drunk people, as you pointed out. But every single place in this city has an underbelly. Every single place in this city has death in contrast to life. You told me when we first started spending time together that you wanted to know the answers. That is why you've been my apprentice. It's why you have been schooled so diligently in our ceremonies. But the one missing piece of that puzzle is your complete absence of life. Your complete absence of knowledge when it comes to life. Why does a wraith exist? Because of what was important to them when they were alive. Because they are so desperate to survive that they cannot pass on. And the same goes for the animated or what have you. Any creature that clings on has something unfinished. A driving force, a motivator. If there is nothing to it but no, but entropy, these creatures would not exist. We would not exist. Do you understand? I think so. So, it is important that we understand the lowest of the low. These people with their distractions, their enjoyments, they are meals for us. There is little we can learn from them. So we have to place them in their correct category. So because they are of no use, we feed from them? Exactly. People that do have use are the ones that the humans, the mortals, are most likely to ignore. They're the ones who truly experience what it is on the cusp of life and death. So useful mortals we don't feed from. Scientists and... Well... People who do good things, right? You're on the right track. Intellectuals, yes. But I look more at uh, natural philosophy. Experience. People who are very close to life and death. Maybe, if you want to be practical about it, doctors, surgeons, nurses, carers. But for the true experience, you look to veterans to vagrants, the homeless, to drug users such as yourself. I'm not a drug user. But you were. And this is what fascinated me about you from the first time I became aware of you. Anyone who dances that line between life and death is valuable to us. We should protect them. We should study them. If you want to think of yourself as a scientist, they can be like germs in a petri dish. If you prefer to think of yourself as more of a shepherd, they can be sheep in your flock. But shepherds don't eat their own sheep. They keep them safe from other predators. What about priests? Or other religious people? Priests, that's interesting. Why do you say priests? Because they deal with life and death. They do? They do. They are here when we enter the world, and they are here when we exit the world again. Mm-hmm. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be a Christian priest. It can be anything, any religious medium. I know that, well, models are often fascinated with religion, and, and I've grown to experience that we, as, well, kindred, have the same fascination, just in another way, now that we know that de death isn't finite, it's infinite. And when you were mortal, were you at all religious? No. My dad was. 
Hmm. Not me. He was Catholic. I used to go to a Catholic school, but that didn't go so well. Hmm. Would you like to spend some time with a priest now? No. No. No, no, and to be honest, this is the wrong part of town to do so, I think. It would only be worth observing a priest during a funeral, and even then, they go through the ritual so many times they start losing meaning. If you find a priest that weeps whenever a funeral takes place, that may be a subject worthy of study. If you find a priest that can just recite the psalms off the top of his head, well, that's someone who is... Not too dissimilar to how you were with the syringe down there. So if you have something to do with life and death, and if you have an understanding of what life and death is, does that make you a good person? Because what about corrupt surgeons? What about corrupt priests? What about people who know what life and death is and uses it for bad things? I'm not uh, the arbiter of what is good and evil. Natalie. I don't understand the difference. I don't understand when something is good and when something is bad. I suppose I hold things in a balance of what is useful and what is wasteful. But that surely differs from person to person, doesn't it? Of course, I would not impose what I believe on you, other than as your mauler your carer, your mentor. Yeah. But if I see you about to just take a life because you do not care for it... I care about people. I just don't know who to care for. Oh, when it's good to care. Hmm. Do you understand? I do, but many of us we kindred, we form attachments to the kind, the mortals, close attachments, close bonds, to prevent ourselves from becoming monsters. The reason you have not become a monster is because I have been tutoring you so diligently, if I can take the credit for that. If I had let you go and behave as you were behaving earlier tonight, and earlier in the last three years, you probably wouldn't be anything but dust at this point. You need the connection to mortality, Natalie. It is very important that you gain it. And if you cannot understand it, that you at the very least simulate it. I'll try my best. By this point, he's led you down the street, through a couple of alleys. He gestures over to three homeless people sleeping in bags boxes around them. See what I mean? We are in the West Village. Incredibly expensive part of New York, and yet still just beneath the surface. Just scratch a little and you will find real life. Real existence. People who in this winter still have to sleep outside. Because like you, they might have a drug addiction and be denied access to a homeless shelter. I don't have a drug addiction. But you did. It's not who I am anymore. You know that. I want you to try to be kind to these people. To try to help them. Do you think you can do that? She almost looks at them like She's scared of them. She doesn't like. She doesn't know what to do. Like this is some kind of animal she's never approached before. Or she's about to enter an exam. Um. Think back to when you were alive. These weren't the kinds of people you associated with. You were wealthy. You were of status. You wouldn't have ever spoken or even given a couple of cents from your purse to someone like this, would you? Um. No, I was always told to stay away from, from homeless people. Well, these people are the closest thing there is to what we are. Homeless people? They have no place. They should not be here. Society should welcome them, should care for them, should 
prevent people like this from even existing. And yet here they are. Here they are. Scratch the surface and there they are. Just like us. Just like we kindred. Everything could be so much easier. But it's not. Everything has to be hidden. Hidden away because we are repulsive. Because what we need to do is repellent. Now when you look at them... These three could all die overnight and very few people would care or mourn. We could die in the day. And there would be so little by which to remember us. That again... No one would care. We have a lot in common. So no, you do not need to befriend these three homeless people, but you need to understand that these are your people now. As a kindred who will eventually be released from me, her mauler, you are going to need to develop a herd, you are going to need to develop mortal relationships, you cannot survive alone in a hole in the ground, because eventually I am not going to be able to deliver, deliver blood bags for you, fresh cadavers for you. You cannot survive that way. I like it that way. Well, you will die in that way. You will meet final death, if that is all there is to you. And as he's saying this, down a staircase on the exterior of a building carrying two laundry bags comes the loping figure of John Smith. Ah. Fortuitous coincidence. Natalie. That man up there you might not remember. He was at the child's table. At our last dinner. Hello. I will blink a little. Have I come out into an alleyway and I suddenly see... What do I see? You recognize the two of them from one of the family dinners, although... No, no, you could, you could name them. You, if nothing else, you have a good memory for names and faces. You recognize, recognize Natalie. You recognize the gaunt man by the name of Mowbray. Mowbray. Natalie. They kind of give them a look. Sort of adjust the bags I'm carrying, to be honest. A bit of money and a bit of drugs It's not that much. Hey. This isn't an ambush, Putinesca. We are not here to steal your laundry. I wrinkle my nose a little at him mentioning my actual name. And I say, Right, so just a social call? I'm kind of doing some work at the moment. Well, be that as it may... Your appearing here is fortuitous, as I say. You have about two years on Natalie, if I'm not mistaken. You're edging into the territory of being a neonate where she is still just a fledgling. I nod my head. Not always understanding some of these terms, but I think I understand what he's uh, talking about. I nod. Yeah, that's right. I've been five, five years. Yeah. Hmm. And I have about three decades on you. So, Natalie, you're going to spend some time with this ruffian. Why? Because you need to know how this city works, how kindred work, and as long as you stay under my wing, you are just going to learn the same things over and over again. You can come back. But when you do, I want you to know something new. So I can come back tonight? No. You'll come back when you know something new. Consider it a pilgrimage, a voyage of discovery. Spread your wings, Natalie. For the love of God. 
You have no idea how disappointed I was when you were prepared to just kill that woman. Grow. Evolve. Have you got that? Yes. Uh, Putanesca, I cannot remember your name. I just remember the family to which you belong. You are now responsible for my ward. Right. I know I may be interrupting serious business. Run it by Donatello if you are going to be seeing him soon. In fact, I recommend running it by Donatello. I have some very important business. But I'm sure he will clear it. He'll be fine with it. Yeah, sure. Uh, his family, after all, I guess that's not an issue. Although, uh, yeah, she'll have to tag along. I I have work to do. I, I always have work to do. You know that, right? He's, o- he's already walking off. Oh, she has many uses... I've never seen someone dispose of a corpse quite as efficiently as her. <laughs> as he starts walking off, there's like a moment of silence. And then I look to Natalie. I kind of offer an awkward smile. What does Natalie look like? She is, uh, she looks like a 19 year old that's really malnourished, um, thin, pale. She has um, dark brown hair around shoulder length, and she's looking a little out of her comfort zone, if not a lot. Right. So I guess, uh, all right, Natalie, it's um, John, John Smith, that, that's my name. Uh, I guess you come in the car, uh, We'll gotta drive, we gotta deliver um, this stuff to uh, the people who need it. Do you deliver laundry? No. Oh. What do you deliver? I gesture to the car, sort of walking and talking. I, uh. I deliver whatever's needed. Whatever I'm told needs to be delivered, you know? Oh, okay. She she walks over to the car and she sits in the back seat. I would have opened the door for you and waited for you to sit before closing it, moving into the front. I kind of at this point pause and say, oh, if you want to sit at the front, you can. I don't need to be sit in the back. I like to sit where it's more dark. Thank you. Right. Sorry. No, no, no. That's fine. Uh, I don't normally have people... Well, actually, that's not true. I'm, I normally drive people around. Cool. Okay. I go to open the door. I get in. You don't mind if I uh, put some music on, do you? Uh, it's your car, I guess. <laughs> yeah. What sort of music do you like? I say as I turn on the radio at finding the same easy listening station I always tune into. Um... I'd, I don't remember what I like. I begin driving back to where I was supposed to go. Sometimes we listen to um, uh, uh, Beethoven and Mozart sometimes when my sire is in a good mood. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, uh, classical stuff. Yeah, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I don't really listen to too much of that. It's all a little bit, uh, I get it, I get it, you know, it's, it's string instruments and that, but I don't know, it doesn't really have anything, like, you know, any spirit to it. Oh, no, I guess not. It's the only, he has two records, and that's what we listen to. Right. Yeah. It's nice weather, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, for this time of year at night, sure. At least it's not raining cats and dogs, eh? <laughs> uh, no. And you drive on your way back to see Uncle Moses. Now, we're going to cut back 
to Ray and Maria having exited the Beavis building. Whoever assigned you to this mission um, meant to throw you under the bus? Yeah, I mean... Uh, yeah. I would ask what you did, but family matters, so... Ask me again some other time. I mean, I'm sure you're very, very good at what you do, Maria. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here, but, you know, we hardly know each other. That is true. Though, from what I've heard from my fellow sisters, bodyguards tend to not live too long, especially if they are good at what they do, which is protecting the family, so. Hey, look, um, hmm. I'm not very trusting, but I am grateful, so thank you, and please don't make any plans to go anywhere just yet. We, I think, need to take a look at what just happened? Uh, somebody's got super loose lips. Can you imagine how we would be rewarded if we sussed out the mystery of those loose lips in Atlantic City? I mean, I don't know what, what you want, but um, yeah, I want a lot of things. And uh, figuring out what just happened and how it happened, that could be the ticket. It would definitely be the ticket out of the shithole that you're currently in. <laughs> yeah, the shithole that I'm currently in. Uh, you have a way with words. I like it. You can't help but look around at Wall Street as uh, she describes it as, well, describes your current situation as a shithole. You've been, been in worse, but it's starting to feel very claustrophobic here. Knowing how much of the family fortune you've just signed over to prop up a garbage company. Let's not forget the arms deals, but yeah. In terms of your knowledge of Kindred in New York, uh, both of you, uh, again, both of you have been to New York before, both as mortals and as undead. And that would have required you to make certain introductions, at least within your family, if not the wider kindred milieu. When it comes to members of your family, you know that the patriarch of New York is one Donatello Giovanni. Has been for a few decades now, and that's some doing. Uh, he's clung on to the position uh, for quite a while. A uh, leonine man, known as surprisingly honest and forthright. That's at least how people describe him favourably. People who decide to describe him unfavourably call him brutal and to the point. He runs a very tight ship, it can be said. He does not involve anyone of the name Giovanni in organised crime at a mortal level, at least. And it is said that his influence extends beyond New York State into New Jersey and maybe up as far as Connecticut. Once we're clear of the lobby and out into the street, keeping my voice low and stepping really close to Maria, hey, uh... I think we need to call this in, don't you think? I do. Uh, just remember, you should probably mention that there is a rat. You'll most likely get to keep your head if you tell them that. I, I think that once we tell them what's going on, or what we think is going on, yeah, maybe. We'll see. Uh, if not, <laughs> good luck with your uh, next assignment. Let's just hope that we don't meet again in the afterlife, whatever that is. Yeah, people in the family keep talking about that as though I'm supposed to know what's going on there, but it hasn't been my area of study, you know? You're able to make some calls, and it, you have to go for around half a dozen people before you get Donatello's voice. 
and as one would expect, he is not going to discuss matters of family business over the phone, and nor would you. Instead, he tells you, Come to the Dreaming Tree. We'll discuss there, now. To the Dreaming Tree, I think we have to go. Sound like an order. Very well. Uh, whether it's fortune, fate, or bad luck, the pair of Maria and Ray make their way to the Dreaming Tree, a very exclusive bar. Yeah, not as far as you know is it Kindred Run, but it is an exclusive bar in Manhattan. Uh, likewise, uh, we have John and Natalie, who are making their way there because that's where Uncle Moses asked for the delivery to be made. It takes some shouldering, some some nudging and some name dropping to allow to, to be admitted but admitted you are and the pair of Natalie and John make a very odd appearance Natalie just sort of in tow as John goes up to Uncle Moses's spot at the bar is he carrying the bags with him or has he left them in the car? I've left them in the car, I know. That that would be really unsubtle and I'd get a scolding. So they're in the car and I've come in with Natalie. It's strange because I'm really not used to having someone like following me. But, you know, she seems okay. Moses, a big guy, jumps off of his bar stool where he was holding court with a few of his friends, walks over to his nephew, does the almost traditional, arms around him, slaps his face genially. I let him do it. That's what he does. I always find it a bit too much, but whatever. Joey, you're back earlier than I thought you'd be. Yeah, Uncle. Well, you know me. Quick, to the point, all sorted in the car in and out that, you know that's why I that's why I send you to these things and who's the young woman ah hey 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 hello I recognize her he points at you with his forefinger and his little finger the little finger finger wearing a heavy signet ring you're Sammy's girl ain't you uh not not anymore we bro broke up you broke up? Ah, oh, too bad. How do you know, Sammy? Oh, we're all one big family, girl. We talk to each other. Oh, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we broke up. He doesn't like me anymore. No, so that's fine. Oh, that ain't what I heard. He's He pines after you like, like you're going out of fashion. You should really call him. It's rude to leave a man hanging like that. I think that's a bad idea. <laughs> I think I need to go to the bathroom. Um, where is the bathroom? Uh, yeah, just round, just round that corner over there. Powder your nose, honey. Uh, what? Uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, Mowbray, uh, wanted her to tag along with me. I need to look after her for a bit, show her some ropes, I guess. I, I... He ain't got no business sticking his fledgling in your care. No? Huh. She, she's, she's simple or something. Did you see the way she was? It was like she was off her face on some d new designer drug. You need to get rid of her. She's going to interfere with your business. We're not in the babysitting business. Well, now, hey, 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 he said she'd be useful. And come on, surely do a favor for him now. We can pull a favor in later. No? All I know about him... Is he likes to look at bodies and poke around with them. The kind of shit that we got accused of for uh, decades before he came along. And if he's saddling you with her, you mind my words, he's out of this city. He's gone. He's going somewhere else and you're being left with the trash. But hey, he puts his hands up. It's your funeral, Joe. Uh, I'm sure I'll be fine, Uncle. I'm sure I'll be fine. Did you get the goods? Of course. It's in the car. Yeah, okay, I'll take the car. Yeah, and oh, and uh, they were a little low on money. 
They offer collateral, some product. What? What product? Oh, it's uh, some standard heroin. Looks pretty good, though. Should sell for a bit. Ah, uh, boy. Mm. You better run that by uh, Donatello. I'd do it myself, but... Uh... You'll be good, kid. You can do it. It's about time you spoke to the big guy. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, D really wanted cash, you know, Joe? Well, I got most of it, but they didn't... <laughs> Look, you know how it is, they fucking spent it on shit. They were trying to... That's why they weren't paying you. They were trying to do a little squeeze on you, trying to get an extra bit of money, that sort of thing. I mean, you you could tell me any excuse under the sun, Joe. It does, doesn't matter. Because in the end, it's not my money. It's the boss's money. Well, if he wants me to go back and break all their shit and rob them of $10... Well, that's what you're going to have to find out, because in this case, I'm not speaking for you. I'm not abandoning you. I'll have your back. But you've got to deliver the news. Yeah, sure. Well, like. That's fine. I can do that. Take the girl with you. It'll be good for her to meet him as well. If nothing else, if he gets angry, he can take it out on her. There's a moment where I'm just silent at that. It kind of makes me angry, but... He slaps your face again. You're a good kid. Balls. He puts his hand between your legs. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. Fine, yeah. I'll go see the big guy and I'll take her with me. I assure you, I, I think she'll be useful. What's Natalie doing in the bathroom? She is uh, having a minor panic attack. She hasn't heard about Sammy from anyone else but her sire in a very long time. Um, and meeting someone who knows him is uh, incredibly frightening for her um, because she's had her head filled with how horrible and how... Uh, terrible he is and that she should never go near him again by her new sire so she's trying to calm herself down um she exits the bathroom um and you wouldn't believe it's possible but she almost looks more pale than she did before do a resolve and composure roll please two successes as uh, another woman goes past you pretty much barging into you and entering the restroom there's a sudden urge to just pursue her in and take her apart at the joints and drink from whatever falls out. You're able to keep it down, but your panic attack is manifesting as a near frenzy. It's very infrequent that you get this close just because your mauler has kept you so protected. But now you're twisting in the wind. It's the most alive you've felt in years. And Natalie exits the bathroom again. She takes a few deep breaths in front of the bathroom door before she makes her way over to the two other men. It's only as you're walking your way back to the bar you realise the hollowness of that gesture again. You're acting more alive now than you ever did when you were down in that cellar. Now, as this is going on, Maria and Ray are also admitted to the Dreaming Tree. You get a view of what's going on. There's a meeting going on at the bar. There's a very nervous-looking young girl. But that's not why you're here. A chaperone sees you immediately. Yeah, uh... The boss said he was expecting you. Come on through. Hey, great, thanks. You're from Boston, right? Yeah, you're saying it wrong. It's Boston. (laughs) Ah, yeah. Massachusetts humor. Here he is. He takes you through to a... What in any bar would just be a luxury booth. Very comfortable seats, a sofa and a U-shape with a table at around knee height. You know from the glass top that many a line of cocaine has been snorted from this table before. 
But today it is looking clear. There's a few cocktail glasses and the unmistakable presence of Donatello Giovanni holding court in a way that a Camarilla prince never could. Lounging there, taking up two seats just with his size. And he isn't obese. He isn't even muscular. He is just big. He is a presence. And his mane of hair and his thick beard accentuate it. He does not look like the typical Don, the typical Italian-American. He looks like a giant. Take a seat, both of you. Definitely do, as I'm told. No objections from me. He gives a nod to a few of the others, and they get up and leave. Uh, He's still maintaining a small entourage of five people sat or stood around. So, I heard you were coming to New York to conduct some business, and then I assumed you were heading straight out again, hence why no meetings were arranged. No disrespect. But here you are. You make every effort to contact me. That tells me you've got something for me. I came down here at the behest of my family to conduct business with artist enterprises. Mm-hmm. Warlocks, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. The deal they offered was just a little too good. The family has been um, <clears throat> easing off that particular investment. In fact, selling them short. He didn't really seem to... Un- if he understood exactly how bad we were screwing him, he didn't hint. But he was displeased. So he offered us a deal. Either sign a contract to reinvest in return for um, controlling interest, or close there too, or he starts talking about the expiration date on the promise. He gives a look to some of his entourage, another nod, another three of them are gone. Leaves you with Donatello, two other kindred, sat in his presence, and the two of you. I'm listening. You have listened to an episode of Red Moon Roleplaying, where we played The Family, a Cults of the Blood Gods chronicle for Vampire the Masquerade 5th edition. Cults of the Blood Gods is published by our friends at Onyx Path Publishing. Our storyteller was the gentleman gamer Matthew Dawkins, and we were also joined by Jason Carl, Clara Herbel, and Bianca Savazzi. The music was created by Itrium Carceri, featuring many collaborations with other artists from their label, Cryo Chamber. Check them out at cryochamber.bandcamp.com and their YouTube channel for more amazing dark ambient. If you want more Vampire the Masquerade content, don't miss out on our chronicle No Man is an Island, as well as The Sacrifice for Chicago by Night. We would like to give massive thanks to our champions of the Red Moon, Martin Hoyshobert, Nastasha Rollerson, Simon Cooper, and David, for their generous support. And we would of course like to thank all of our other patrons. Without your support, the show would not be possible. If you want to support our work, please check us out on Patreon. You can get access to bonus campaigns for Cult Divinity Lost and Coriolis there, as well as get early and raw access to all of our recordings. You can also hear your name read on the show as a champion of the Red Moon, as well as play Cult with us. Most importantly, that support is what keeps the show going, so do check us out there. Thank you again for listening, and see you soon again.